Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kohler Group's Expansion into China webinar series. This is part four of 10 webinar sessions. The title of today's presentation is Joint Venture Agreements in China. A critical aspect to a joint venture in China is the negotiation of the joint venture contract between the Western Party and the Chinese Party. In this webinar, we will be focusing on China's foreign investment regime, why foreign parties use joint ventures to conduct business in China. We'll be looking at the types of joint venture structures, the challenges that foreign investors face when negotiating these contracts and operating the joint venture. Lastly, we will provide tips for drafting an effective joint venture contract for your business success, and most importantly, in order to maintain an amicable, amicable relationship with your Chinese partner. I'm very pleased to have our presenter, Mr. Steve Yu, managing partner at Armstrong Teasdale, as our speaker for today. Before we begin today's presentation, I just want to make sure that we have a perfect sound system. If you would be so kind as to click on the hand button in the control panel, that will allow me to know that we have no technical difficulties. So if you could just go ahead and click on the hand button. Please note that the webinar session will not be recorded, nor will it be distributed at the end of today's presentation, as this is just a internal regulation by Armstrong and Teasdale. But if you do have questions or you do have comments you would like to share, then please do insert them in the questions panel of the, uh, of the control panel. We are looking to have about a 40-minute presentation today from Steve, and we're looking to then have a 15 to 20-minute Q&A at the end. Now, it's always lovely to see new faces on our webinar series, and I would just like to briefly introduce who we are. Kohler Group, a CSC company, provides a wide range of market entry consulting, incorporation, tax, accounting, and human resource services to organizations interested in ent entering and expanding their businesses into Asia, primarily into China, Hong Kong, and Singapore. We have just over 120 professionals that are located throughout our 10 offices in the region. And one of our main objectives is to help foreign investors with cost-effective, efficient solutions for their entry and expansion within the region. Now a little bit about myself as your moderator for today's session. My name is Christina Kohler Coluccia. I'm a director at Kohler Group and I've been with the firm since 2003 when I opened our very first China office in Shanghai. I've been assisting companies not only with their entry into China but also their expansion within the country and unfortunately their liquidation for their unsuccessful uh, solutions. I'm co-author of our monthly magazine, ChinaInvest.biz, which highlights all the latest trends and regulations associated with the activities occurring in the region. So without further ado, I'm going to allow Steve now to begin his presentation and firstly introduce himself and Armstrong Teasdale Shanghai to you. Steve? Yes, thank you very much, Christine, for the introduction. And good morning to those of you in uh, Europe and North America, and uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon to those of you in uh, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and the rest of the Asia Pacific region. Uh, I'm Steve Yu. I'm currently leading the, the Shanghai office of Armstrong Teasdale uh, in China. Uh, I'm very delighted to have the chance to join today's webinar hosted by the Color Group. Um, it is estimated that actually around 30 to 40 percent of foreign invested enterprises in China uh, take the form of a joint venture. And I appreciate that actually having a joint venture can be a very important and valuable investment for many of you uh, in the audience. So um, uh, I'm, uh, I will be very glad in the next 40 minutes uh, to uh, share our experience in China and observation about the market on how to structure a successful JV uh, on the local law and also the business environment uh, in China. Um, by way of introduction, my, myself is an investment uh, and a trade lawyer, uh, having practiced the joint venture law uh, for more than 18 years. And Armstrong Teasdale is also one of the uh, 
earliest Western law firm that has been licensed by the Chinese government to practice law in China. Um, if you turn to the uh, page on the agenda, uh, I have uh, taken the liberty uh, to design today's uh, webinar uh, with uh, five parts. Uh, if you look at the agenda, uh, on the first part, uh, we will give an overview about China's foreign investment region. Uh, and then I will briefly uh, examine uh, the good reason why having a joint venture uh, will make sense uh, to do a business in China. Uh, thirdly, I will explain uh, the two types of common joint ventures allowed by local law, uh, followed by some of the challenges that we observed uh, in operating a foreign invested GV in China. Uh, and then after that, I will be happy uh, to offer uh, a few practical tips for drafting effective joint venture contract uh, for your China operations. Uh, on the last point, I appreciate that actually in practice, most JV contracts uh, are actually drafted by lawyers. Uh, but I think uh, it perhaps will be um, helpful to uh, businessmen and senior decision makers uh, like those of you in the audience, uh, if I can give you a picture of the uh, important critical issues, the common issues in a typical uh, China JV contract, I think this probably will help uh, with your negotiation uh, when you sit down together with a local Chinese partner uh, to discuss about a JV relationship. So on the next page, uh, China's foreign investment region. I'd like to do first to give you a three minutes overview uh, about how China regulates foreign investment uh, projects. Um, well, in many parts of our world, uh, foreign investors normally can come in a country and set up a company in a few days uh, and then start to do the business at their free will. Uh, in China, things operate quite differently. Uh, although for the past three decades, China has been working very hard to build up a market-based economy, uh, but the way China regulates foreign investment projects are still quite based on the uh, uh, previous uh, planned economy. Uh, that means uh, every piece of a foreign investment project uh, will have to be subject to review and approval by local Chinese authority, and in some cases by the central Chinese government. And then after that, the foreign investor project need to apply for a business license and a number of other routine business registration before they can legally operate in China. And uh, all those foreign investor projects uh, are actually subject to restriction uh, imposed by the investment regulations and also a very unique investment catalog. Uh, this investment catalog uh, will classify all types of foreign investment into four types. That will be encouraged, permitted, restricted, and prohibited. Uh, it's straightforward uh, to receive an approval if your JV will be deemed to be fall within encouraged and permitted categories. Uh, but if unfortunately uh, the industry sector of your JV is deemed to be restricted, uh, then having a JV probably will be the only way that you will be allowed to do this business in China. Uh, it is not possible for you to buy out your JV partner at a later and then to do the business as a wholly foreign owned business. Uh, if unfortunately the business sector is deemed to be prohibited, then um, it will not be possible to receive a approval. Uh, having said that, it, it is very important to know that actually the, the actual classification uh, of any type of proposed business activity uh, is subject to the uh, discretion of the relevant approval authority. Uh, furthermore, uh, in certain strategic industry, um, Chinese policy guidance uh, may also limit foreign participation uh, in a GB to perhaps only 50 percent or less than 50 percent of the shares in that GB. Uh, this will depend on the sector and the nature of the business. Um, 
the authority to review foreign investor projects, including foreign investor JVs in China, will be the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, this is the China's central governmental department uh, who has a responsibility to review all foreign investments. Um, it is our observation that in recent years, in order to promote regional economic growth, uh, the Ministry of Commerce and its local branches has become, has taken a pretty uh, open-minded and flexible approach in the approving process than before, particularly in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, so in, in terms of timing, in our experience at this moment, uh, it normally will require at least one and a half months to three months uh, in order to clear all the approval from the Ministry of Commerce and in some cases uh, some other sector uh, regulators. Uh, so uh, it is very important uh, to uh, prepare and plan earlier if you would like to do a business in China by way of a joint venture. Um, I should also mention as a side note, uh, all joint ventures in China are subject to, are subject to a standard 25% corporate income tax uh, unless uh, your JV will be qualified to enjoy certain local preferential tax treatment. Uh, so uh, this uh, 25% of uh, uh, standard corporate income tax is the same that will also subject to all local Chinese invested enterprises. Um, on the next page, um, I'd like to first uh, um, examine together with you some of the common benefits of having a GV in China. Uh, apparently, having a joint venture with a selected, uh, carefully selected, I would say, uh, local partner uh, can offer a number of benefits. For example, it can be a faster entry into the local markets and uh, can lower down your market entry cost uh, because you, uh, your local partner, in most cases, uh, knows the market pretty well. Uh, and uh, if uh, your local partner uh, is a very strong local market player, uh, they probably have already have established customer base and market presence that can help your business, your service and products to reach the target market. Um, in, in some other cases, a uh, strong partner can also provide uh, critical assets, otherwise a foreign investor uh, will find it very difficult to obtain or acquire uh, by themselves. Uh, those may include uh, distribution network, uh, land, um, labors, uh, and also special licenses. Um, in the recent years, given that state-owned enterprises in China has become more and more powerful, if not dominant, in the Chinese economy. So uh, sometimes teaming up with a state-owned enterprises and set up a joint venture can also allow a foreign party uh, to access to local government who purchase uh, product or services uh, for the state or the uh, local government and their offices. So that's all the uh, very clear uh, benefits. Uh, another reason, uh, another benefit for having a JV, uh, it's about market entry. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, foreign investment project can, in some cases, seem to be restricted. Uh, those normally including media, publication, uh, telecom, education, and basically everything uh, with respect to the internet. Uh, so. Uh, uh, in those sectors, normally the state law and the investment catalog will require you to do the business together uh, with a local party. And in many cases, the local approval authority will prefer that you set up a company together with a state-owned enterprises. Uh, so uh, on that front, having a GV uh, probably will be the only way to do business uh, in those sectors. Uh, in some uh, in some other very exceptional cases, having a JV can also be a uh, interim arrangement uh, to a ultimate acquisition project. Uh, considering that in China, uh, that due diligence normally 
is not easy. And the corporate information of a target company sometimes is not accurate or in public domain. So it is very difficult for a buyer uh, to have a thorough uh, review of the performance and the history and the liability of a target company. Uh, so in that case, some of our clients uh, decided to first acquire a small shares into a local company. That's their target company. Uh, they will then convert the local Chinese company into a JV and then to test the water by working together with the local partner for perhaps one or two years before they will decide whether they would like to acquire all the shares in the uh, uh, local Chinese company. Uh, so uh, uh, for that reason, having a JV uh, can be a good internal arrangement for you to test the relationship and to assess whether an acquisition uh, will make sense. So these are all the good reasons uh, for having a joint venture uh, in China. On the, uh, on, on the same token, uh, having a joint venture will also present uh, a number of uh, challenges. Uh, for example, culture differences. Uh, for those of you who uh, probably have known China pretty well. Uh, China is uh, such a large state and which each region have their own culture, languages and uh, preferences and sometimes uh, a wholly foreign owned enterprises will experience culture resistance. So uh, working together with a local Chinese party uh, will help to address those issues. Uh, trust and cooperation uh, will be another fundamental issue. Uh, given that a Sino foreign joint ventures have partners from different countries and cultures and different business experience, uh, lack of trust and cooperation can sometimes compromise the achievement of operational goal and objective. Uh, in a joint venture, all decisions will have to be made jointly uh, by all the JV parties. Um, and, uh, it can sometimes trigger dialogue in decision making. Um, this can also lead to dispute uh, in the GV and then require dispute resolution. Those, this issue can uh, all complicate uh, the operation of JV in China compared with a company if set up by a foreign investor themselves. Um, exit strategy. Uh, because your JV is in China, that is actually a foreign country, uh, to you. So it will be a little bit more complicated uh, to get out of the GV or walk away from that uh, than if you are doing a GV in your own home country. Uh, so uh, these are all the common challenges and issues uh, that we have seen in a typical GV here in China. Um, frankly speaking, I don't think there's a one for all solution to address these challenges. Uh, my suggestion is, uh, I think you should ask yourself and also you, JV partner, a lot of fundamental questions before you will decide how and with whom you are going to set up a JV. For example, uh, technical questions that you should ask will including how much do you know about your JV partners? And uh, um, do you think your partners share the same way? value and objective uh, about the potential GV relationship, uh, do you have a plan uh, to deal with joint decision making and uh, also uh, uh, um, conflicts uh, and also do you have a plan to uh, exit from the GV in case uh, the GV doesn't make sense. So these are all the questions need to be considered and assessed uh, before a relationship will be committed by a formal JV contract or relationship. Um, on the next page of the slides, um, I'd like to uh, give you uh, some uh, brief introduction about the uh, type of the joint venture uh, that, that is allowed uh, on the local law. Um, if you look at the slides, uh, I mentioned about equity JV and also cooperative JV. Um, actually, in countries outside of China, 
uh, JVs can mean a broad range of commercial arrangement of operations. For example, uh, it can mean uh, two or more parties combine their resources to bid for the award of a contract uh, to construct a infrastructure project. Uh, or it can also refer to um, the situation where, uh, let's say, two or more parties combine to undertake joint research and agree how they will respectively uh, share the results. Uh, in that case, that will work similar to a partnership. Uh, however, under Chinese law, uh, a joint venture is specified uh, and defined as a situation where two or more parties to combine to put their capital together and create a new and independent jointly owned uh, corporate vehicle. Uh, with the corporate vehicle will have, have its own independent management and access to sufficient resources, for example, staff, finance, assets, and so on, uh, so that it will enable the JV to conduct its activity on a long-lasting basis. Uh, so uh, in other words, when we're talking about having a JV in China, uh, it basically means you will have to set up a new company, uh, and uh, uh, the company will have to be set up together with a local Chinese partner. It is not a partnership. It is not a uh, typical joint project. It is a new company with a capital investment from both parties of the JV. Uh, so that's one of the major difference uh, when we talk about a joint venture in the legal sense uh, in the Chinese environment. Um, the two typical joint venture will be equity JV and the cooperative JV. Uh, equity JV or EJV uh, is a limited liability Chinese legal entity created by one or more Chinese party uh, together with one or more foreign investors. Uh, the uh, investors or the shareholders in the EJV uh, share profits and losses strictly in proportion to their respective shares uh, in the EJV. For example, uh, if your shares in the EJV is uh, 55%, and then uh, you will be entitled restrictedly 55% of the profits and the losses, no more and no less. Uh, a EJV normally will have a limited uh, duration or terms, normally that's 20 years, but this can be uh, renewed by a application to the original approval authority. Um, one of the major advantages for a EJV is that um, the EJV law and regulation are considered to be uh, very complete and predictable. Um, uh, it has been in place for more than de two, de two decades in China. Uh, so uh, uh, it is a very developed region. Uh, disadvantage of EJV, however, uh, including, for example, uh, the uh, foreign investors' potential loss of control over certain business decisions, uh, and secondly, uh, a non-alignment of the interests of the parties, considering that different parties may have different uh, uh, drive of interest in that JV, and thirdly, in some cases, there will be a potential loss of uh, protection of imported technology. Uh, in most situations uh, in the JV in China, the, it will be the foreign party who will provide the technology. Uh, so uh, uh, potentially, that can, you will see uh, some infringement matter when you introduce the technology into a China JV. Uh, a cooperative JV, or CJV, uh, is a more flexible form of JV. Um, um, it will allow both the uh, Chinese and uh, the uh, foreign party to have a more contractual freedom uh, to structure the cooperation. Uh, for example, the EJV, sorry, the CJV um, is perhaps the only investment vehicle under our law uh, which allow early recovery of the investment through accelerated repayment of capital uh, during the terms of job entry. Uh, Another major advantage of a CGV is uh, flexibility. Uh, unlike EJV, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the EJV, sharing of profits and losses must be uh, correlated 
uh, to a party's percentage of shares in the JV, uh, in a CJV, in a cooperative JV, uh, the parties may agree on a, on a um, arrangement uh, for sharing of the profits and losses which do not correspond to the ratio of the party's shares. Uh, thus, with um, creative structure, uh, it will be possible to arrange for the foreign investor uh, in a CJV to have a higher proportion of the profits than the local Chinese party, even though um, there's a lack of controlling ownership. Uh, for example, if you only have, uh, let's say, 20% of the shares in the, in the CJV, um, by agreement, uh, it is still possible for you to be entitled to 70%, uh, for example, of the profits uh, of the CJV. Uh, this gave a lot of uh, flexibility uh, compared with a equity JV. Um, the, uh, the differences uh, of the two type of GV um, can be seen on the next page of my slides. Uh, in this slide, um, it exam from different aspects of how a CGV and EGV can operate differently uh, from a legal basis, financing, profit distribution, and dissolution. Uh, I think this chart is quite uh, uh, self explanatory. Uh, so I think I should perhaps leave that for you uh, to give a reading uh, after the section. Uh, uh, I would suggest that we uh, move forward uh, to the next section uh, of our talk today. That will be uh, the tips for drafting GV contracts. Um, I, I think before we will talk about uh, the essential issue about a JV contract, I'd like to first mention about the governing law uh, of a JV contract. Um, I appreciate that many of you in the audience and also perhaps many of the lawyers who are advising you from your home country probably will prefer that your China JV should be governed by uh, the law of your home country. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there's a mandatory requirement on the Chinese law. Uh, that is, all China JV contracts uh, will have to be governed by Chinese law and the regulation. Uh, therefore, it is not possible uh, for your China-based JV to be governed by the law of New York uh, or the United Kingdom or any other jurisdiction. It will have to be Chinese law. Um, the having a joint venture, having a joint venture in China normally will require a number of documents and agreement. Uh, in our experience, um, uh, you will at least uh, need the following contract, as you can see from the slide: confidential editing agreement, head of terms, formal JV contract, and some uh, side agreements. Um, Confidential editing agreement. Um, in, in, in China and perhaps in all the countries, when you have a GV, negotiation of GV often will involve sharing of sensitive information uh, between the parties. Uh, so uh, um, we, we think it is in the both parties' best interest. Uh, both the Chinese party and the foreign party to ensure that their discussion and any due diligence information that they may disclose to each other uh, should be kept complete um, and also in uh, complete confidential. Uh, so that's why it is important uh, before you will enter into any formal discussion about the GV or before you will provide any sensitive information to the other party, uh, it is important to first sign a confidentiality agreement. Uh, Chinese law on confidentiality agreement is quite similar uh, to Western law. Uh, so uh, normally the most straightforward way to do that is to use your home country uh, confidentiality agreement uh, as a base document and then to engage a Chinese lawyer to consider local law requirement to put together a quick uh, agreement in the Chinese contact uh, so that things can move forward quickly. Um, height of terms. Um, height of terms are in some other cases normally also referred as term sheet uh, will generally contain a statement of the proposed key terms of the transaction or cooperation. 
uh, it is intended to serve the basis for negotiating a formal joint venture. Uh, it is very important to know that under Chinese law, uh, term sheets and also head of terms are not legally binding. Uh, so if the party intend to have the head of terms to be legally binding, you have to have a clause uh, at the end of the document to say all the terms are binding. Otherwise, it is a non-legally binding document and either party can walk away from the commitment uh, documented by those head of terms. Um, formal joint venture contract uh, is the uh, core document uh, to be signed uh, by the parties uh, and also the doc this document uh, will govern the formation of the joint venture vehicle and any applicable condition precedent, uh, the running of the GV uh, and also funding and distribution policies and uh, transfer of shares and termination and exit strategies. So this is a very important document. Uh, this document uh, will vary considerably uh, depending on the objective uh, of the GV parties and also uh, the nature of the business. Uh, I will give more details about GV contract in uh, uh, at the later stage of this uh, uh, of this talk. Um, in some situation, um, um, the GV parties will often need to enter into various uh, salary agreement or side agreement uh, to enable the joint venture to conduct its business. Uh, this can include IP intellectual property assignment or license agreement, uh, technology service agreement, uh, supply agreement, and also in some cases, the common agreement uh, to allow uh, the senior level manager from one GV party to be seconded to work uh, for the GV. Uh, uh, I should note actually among the four type of agreement, uh, the formal GV contract and also the set agreement, uh, salary agreements, uh, will all need to be approved by the Chinese governmental authorities. Uh, confidentiality agreement and term sheets uh, will not require Chinese government review, no approvals. Um, on the next page, uh, the first issue I want to mention is about control uh, and uh, corporate governance issue uh, in uh, China GV. Um, in the joint venture in China, there, there are three very important uh, bodies uh, in terms of uh, um, power and authority allocation. Uh, the first body is board of directors. Uh, Chinese law will allow a board with either one member, three member, or any member more than three but less than 13. Uh, but you can now have a board with two board members. Uh, this is designed to uh, avoid a dialogue uh, in the board. Uh, and also, on the Chinese law, uh, each board members only have one vote, including the chairman. And none of the directors will have a casting vote. Uh, this is a very unique requirement on the Chinese law. Um, the second layer will be the uh, management team. Normally, they will include the China CEO, uh, some companies prefer to name it as a general manager, and also the head of each department, the head of finance, head of sales, uh, head of marketing, and in some cases, head of HR. So this is normally deemed as a management team. Chinese law requires that members of the Chinese uh, management team uh, will have to be recruited uh, or terminated by the board. They need to report to the board uh, and take the call by the board members. Uh, the third layer will be the supervisor board. Uh, this is a very unique concept on the Chinese company law. Uh, I believe this is also uh, a concept that our law borrowed from the German company law. Uh, the supervisor is actually the check and balance. Uh, uh, they will have the uh, authority to oversee uh, the performance of the board members and the management team to make sure that uh, all compliance matters uh, will be handled properly uh, and uh, all tax matters and financial matters are handled 
uh, properly in line with Chinese law requirement. Uh, in some way, um, supervisor worked similar to the uh, um, independent non-executive directors uh, in some Western countries. Uh, supervisors can request to sit in board meetings, but the supervisors will have no right to vote in board meetings. Uh, um, in terms of uh, who can be supervisors, Chinese law said uh, neither board members or managers of the company can become a supervisor. Uh, supervisor have to be someone who are independent. So normally uh, they are nominated by someone from the uh, shareholders or by licensed professionals such as accountants, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, or in some cases uh, someone who are well respected in the industry sector in which the JV uh, operates. Uh, so that's, that's the uh, um, three layers in a China JV in terms of corporate governance. I recommend that actually in your JV agreement uh, you will need to at least provide some details on corporate governance to, to include, for example, uh, the um, the extent of the authority given to each layer of the management team, board of directors, and also the supervisors, and also the choice of appointees to the board and the supervisor board, uh, how these people will be selected and uh, appointed, and also the authority to retain the important members of the company, and also the uh, scope of protection of each JV parties on fundamental decision uh, and uh, uh, and changes, particularly when uh, uh, one of the GV parties may be a minority uh, shareholder uh, in the GV. Um, the um, the another issue, important issue to minority shareholder is about protection. Uh, for that purpose, Chinese law has a uh, mandatory requirement that for for certain type of decision in the GV, it will have to be subject to unanimous votes, uh, favorable votes uh, by the board members. Uh, these are listed in my uh, in my slides. Uh, for example, amendment to the articles, uh, increase or change to the capital structure. Uh, this also including transfer of shares to a third party, and also mortgage of GV assets, and also merge. Uh, division of dissolution of the GV. Uh, this can in some way uh, give some protection to the minority shareholder. Um, it is very important to know that uh, this requirement is mandatory. Uh, you cannot uh, uh, change the requirement by a private contract, uh, by a private JV contract. Um, uh, whether this requirement uh, on the Chinese law can uh, the good or uh, bad news uh, will depend on uh, which side of the board uh, that it will sit on. If you are a minority, sh minority shareholder, apparently this is good news, but uh, if you are a majority, uh, majority shareholder, uh, that will require you uh, to have more uh, elaboration and discussion before the other GV parties, before you can make a final decision. Even the minority shareholder in your joint venture only have 1% of the shares. Uh, they can uh, still effectively block uh, all your important decisions for the JV. Um, how about other actions? Uh, uh, except for the four actions that I listed on the slide, uh, all the other actions or decisions to be made by the JV uh, will be subject to negotiation and subject to the agreement in your JV contracts. Uh, you can agree with your JV party what decision will require only a simple uh, majority approval by the board, and what decision will perhaps require at least a two-thirds of the uh, 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 favorable vote uh, by the board. Uh, you will have a lot of contractual freedom to decide on these matters. Um, on the next page of my slides, um, I want to mention uh, about the um, IP matters. Um, there's um, 
in the typical GV, there's uh, almost some uh, IP of technology uh, to be transferred uh, to the GV, generally uh, by way of a license rather than uh, outright transfer. Uh, so uh, uh, I suggest that uh, you should consider and make it clear in the GV contract whether the license or the technology that you will give uh, or introduce to the GV will be an exclusive or non-exclusive license. Uh, you should also make it very clear how the territory uh, will be defined in case that is an exclusive license. Um, um, your GV contract should also uh, deal with how improvement uh, uh, should, be, uh, um, should be discussed and how ownership of those improvements should be, should be shared. Um, also consider what will happen uh, to the IP, the original IP and the improvement uh, in case the GV uh, will be terminated. Uh, will the technology belong to the party who originally introduced the GV? Uh, in that case, who will have the ownership uh, to the improvement? Uh, should each party have a non-exclusive uh, license to continue to use the uh, IP and the improvement and whether the use should be subject to a loyalty from one party to another party. Uh, these are all the important matters uh, that you should uh, consider. Um, on a special note, um, um, I, I think uh, joint venture um, triggers important consideration about IP protection. Uh, uh, at this stage, uh, many multi multinational companies uh, still struggle to protect their IPs in China. Uh, this is uh, perhaps a common headache, uh, if I can say, uh, to many Western companies in China. Uh, protection of IPs in most developed markets uh, occurs primarily through legally binding agreement, enforcing the court uh, or by enforce law enforcement authority. Uh, but uh, in China, uh, the records of the legal system uh, can be lengthy and uh, inadequate in many cases. Uh, uh, I, I think many Western investors uh, um, will have to consider additional measures and proactive steps in order to protect their IPs. Normally those steps will include, uh, for example, uh, consider leaving the blueprints uh, of the technology at home, uh, and also perhaps uh, keeping critical IP completely out of the joint venture. Uh, some of our clients uh, have set up joint venture that are restricted to those steps in the value chain that involve limited IP, uh, like assembling, packaging, and tailoring. Uh, uh, such an approach is feasible only perhaps when uh, local innovation lags behind global standard and uh, clearly. Uh, when the critical IP component can easily be separated into a step of the, IP, of the value chain. Uh, some other uh, steps may include, for example, uh, charging for IP upfront. Uh, some uh, multinational companies in China have chosen to sell their intellectual property to the joint venture, um, uh, or through an upfront cash payment or an upfront uh, license fee, uh, so that uh, you don't have to worry uh, that you will not be able to cash out your uh, investment of IP uh, into the GV at a later stage. So that's the normal best practice for uh, IP protection in the GV. Um, on the next stage, uh, I mentioned about the corporate opportunities. Um, in, in, in the China-based GV on the, and the government by China, and it's law. Um, generally, a GV party will be required to offer to the GV business opportunity within the scope of the GV's business. Uh, I, I think uh, you will need to consider in your GV contract, uh, uh, if a GV will turn a business opportunity down, uh, whether it's a new business or an uh, acquisition, uh, for example, whether uh, it should uh, allow the other GV parties to take up on the same or perhaps not uh, more favorable terms uh, than those offered to the GV. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, it will easily trigger a lot of conflicts 
uh, between the party of the TV on who should take the corporate opportunities. Um, Non-compete uh, will be another uh, difficult and sensitive part of the GV uh, to negotiate. Uh, you will want to consider whether the GV and the shareholders should be subject to a non-compete and whether there should be any uh, constraint on hiring GV personnel during the GV and for some period after one GV partner will uh, walk away from the GV. And also you will need to consider uh, to what extent can the GV enter into arrangement with a competitor of one of the GV parties after GV will be terminated. Uh, so all these issues will need to be addressed uh, earlier uh, in the GV contract. Um, competition and the antitrust issue. Uh, uh, by way of introduction, uh, um, about six years ago, China published its first antitrust uh, regulation. Uh, uh, this law actually has been under discussion for more than, more than 60 years uh, under the uh, legislation bodies. Uh, so once the law has been introduced in the market, it has changed the many way uh, that the JV operates. Um, a joint venture between competitors or potential competitors uh, in China can trigger antitrust or competition law concerns. Um, John Venture, um, considering their business, they, they normally vary significantly. Uh, for example, uh, some John Ventures will involve um, perhaps uh, production, marketing, sales and research, uh, and also perhaps development or group buying. Uh, for those GV, uh, uh, these are most likely uh, to cause competitive harm and therefore to be challenged on antitrust com and also competition ground. Uh, for example, if the GV will be a marketing or sales joint venture, uh, particularly there's a very little integration or economic risk sharing uh, to justify the constraint uh, or restriction of, uh, of fixed price or territory allocation, uh, those joint ventures are very likely to trigger a lot of antitrust concern and the clearance. Uh, on the other side, if the joint venture only involves production, research, and development or purchase, uh, those are normally deemed to be pro-competitive, uh, and therefore those joint venture will normally will not require a clearance uh, by the antitrust regulator in China before uh, you will set up a GV. Uh, so uh, 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 perhaps a sum of rules normally will be to consider uh, whether the um, market in which the GV will operate is the is a very competitive uh, market, and whether the GV parties uh, will have a significant or dominant market share uh, in the relevant market. Um, another issue is about breakup. Uh, many lawyers in China uh, compare GVs to marriage. Uh, they see honeymoon at the first beginning of a GV and later on uh, there will be dispute and differences. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, many GV after four or five years of, of operation will uh, end it as a same bad, different dream situation. Uh, so it is very important that a UGV contract should address those issues uh, in case um, uh, you will no longer be interested in uh, moving forward with such an venture. Uh, so you need to have a uh, um, trigger, triggering event uh, clearly set up uh, in the joint venture contract. Those are including um, perhaps a um, default event, uh, which can include material breach of the contract, and also non-default event. For example, uh, events that reflect a frustration of the business intent, such as a failure to achieve the business uh, sales and operational targets, so management dialogue and also third-party third offer uh, to buy out one of the parties or both parties. Um, um, for protection of um, minority shares, uh, it will also be important uh, to build into uh, call options and pool rights, uh, right of first offer, right of first refusal and also tag along and drag along mechanism. 
Uh, these are very complex corporate, um, corporate uh, control and balance mechanism. Uh, I think it's perhaps another best place for me uh, to give all the details about those uh, check and balance mechanism during this uh, webinar. Uh, but I will be happy to elaborate and assist you to um, uh, evaluate whether you should in your TV contract uh, to have this mechanism. Uh, if you would like to email uh, to me um, the uh, situation of your GV, uh, I will be very happy to, dis to discuss this matter with you offline. Uh, I should mention actually all these mechanisms, uh, call option, and pull option, tag along, drag along, will all have to be subject to the Chinese governmental approval. Um, I should uh, also briefly mention about digital resolution. Uh, I should, mediation uh, is a very common method for digital resolution in the Western world, uh, but in China, this is not very common, and also it's not uh, legally binding. Uh, the most common way is to do a arbitration or litigation. Uh, our firm normally recommend Western clients to take arbitration uh, in their JV contract uh, due to that at this moment, Chinese court systems are still not entirely independent from the local government. Uh, having arbitration can ensure to some extent that you dispute with a local Chinese party can be heard uh, in a transparent and independent way. Uh, there's a number of regional dispute uh, arbitration center in Asia, mm -hmm. Singapore Arbitration Center, Hong Kong Arbitration Center, uh, CTAC, uh, in Beijing and in Shanghai and in Shenzhen uh, are also independent and reputable uh, uh, arbitration institute to consider. Uh, it's very important that your arbitration clause to give details about the number of arbitrators, uh, the language of the arbitration, place of arbitration, uh, and also who will bear the legal cost uh, in case um, um, one party will lose the arbitration. Uh, I should also mention as a word of caution, never, never agree to have you dispute with a China party to be heard by a court outside of China, not in the UK, not in US, not in Singapore or Hong Kong. The reason is very simple. China has never enforced a decision made by a foreign court. So uh, it will not make sense for you to bring a Chinese party to have an expensive court action in your home country, but end up uh, not being able to enforce the court decision in China. Uh, I think that um, gave the uh, last slide of my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I think of today's takeaway, and before I return uh, the section back to Christina, I'd like to quickly summarize my presentation uh, by the following, uh, perhaps, the four points. First one, uh, that is select your local GV parties carefully and don't rush into the GV unless you know your GV partner well enough. Uh, my second point is uh, always sign a confidential attitude agreement before you will discuss a formal GV relationship. Uh, my third takeaway for you is bear in mind control is always very important in the China-based GV. So design your GV contract carefully to ensure that you have sufficient control. And my last point will be take proactive approach to protect your intellectual property rights and be prepared to deal with infringement matters and non-compete matters. All right. Um, thank you for your uh, attention on my talk. Uh, I think I should now turn the section back to Christina. Yes, Steve, thanks a lot for your for your detailed presentation. Um, there have been quite a series of, of questions that have um, that have come in, you know, based on, on, on points that you discussed within your presentation, but also just opinion questions. So so I'll go through them one by one. Um, so the first the first question is you mentioned on your on your first slide that there are about thirty to forty percent of foreign investments that come into China are JVs. In, in your experience, how many of those are successful in the mar market? How many of those have caused the foreign investor to exit the market? 
uh, that's about the percentage. Uh, <laughs> there, we, we haven't seen any uh, official uh, statistics published by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. Uh, so I can only talk about based on the experience of myself and also our law firm in China. Uh, we, we see in the past two decades when during which our office offer in China, we see uh, normally at least 40% of joint ventures in China will end up by a buyout uh, after four or five years uh, post their setup in China. Uh, and who's in, buying who in, out? Is it is it the foreign investor that buys out the Chinese party or is it vice versa? In, in the 1990s and uh, also in the late, late 1980s, normally it is the foreign party uh, who will buy out the Chinese party because at that moment, foreign party normally is more capital uh, sophisticated. Uh, in other words, they have more capital than the local Chinese party. But things changed a lot these days. In the past one or two years, we have seen an increased number of cases in which it is the Chinese party who no longer has the interest or in some cases the patience uh, to maintaining a joint venture with their foreign party and therefore they have in many cases more capital uh, than the Western party and therefore they force the Western party out by a buyout. Uh, so the market changed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's also a reflection of the landscape of the economy uh, of China uh, at this moment. Uh, that, that also gave some uh, even more important idea how you should carefully design your JV contract to make sure that uh, uh, you won't be forced uh, out of a JV without reasonable compensation. If there will be reasonable compensation, how you will price the value of the JV and uh, how you agree about the buyout price. So that, that leads me on to the second question. Um, you know, you, you mentioned actually, for, from my from my takeaway of your presentation, it's really the the actual pre-investment phase that's the most critical. It's drafting the confidentiality agreement. It's drafting the formal um, uh, JV contract template. It's making sure that you have all these ancillary agreements in place as well. It's it's all that pre. It's actually that negotiation phase. So in your experience, what is the average negotiation time frame? And, and do you have some tips on this negotiation period? I mean, do you find that foreign investors generally give up or are they still persevering to get these agreements signed and to move forward with, with the joint ventures? Uh, in our experience, a, uh, a serious GB normally takes at least uh, two or three months uh, to negotiate. Uh, given that a GB is a very complicated corporate vehicle and uh, um, uh, Serious parties always wish to uh, take good amount of quality time to sit down together uh, with their local parties uh, to write the GV contract and address all the potential issues. Uh, so I think uh, you probably want to budget at least uh, perhaps a six to eight weeks uh, to go through the negotiation and another four weeks to prepare uh, the negotiation negotiation of the GV contract, that adds all the time to perhaps two to three months. Um, there, there's, a, there's a very, very, one of the very typical Chinese way to negotiate contract. Uh, I, won't think, I, I don't think that's a bad thing actually. I would say that's a culture thing is, uh, you will find that very interesting that many Chinese businessmen have a lot of patience in negotiating a contract. Uh, so uh, I, my, my words of recommendation to the Western party is uh, be patient in negotiating the contract. I don't like the time and the agenda of the other party to control how you negotiate the contract. Uh, there's nothing worse than a JV project that was agreed uh, during rush hour and then you end up with a lot of issues that is now settled. Uh, so prepare self well and plan a lot of time to negotiate and in most cases uh, you will see a very patient senior level Chinese businessman uh, sitting on the other side of the table smiling at you who have a lot of time to go through the contract one by one. Uh, so be patient uh, and be selective 
uh, in the topic that you will bring to the table. Another question that's come in is in relation to the confidentiality agreement because you said you don't need to register this in China. Um, so the question is, could the confidentiality agreement be submitted to foreign law and how do you enforce confidentiality agreements in general? It, it, unlike the JV contract, which will have to be governed by Chinese law, it is possible to have your confidential edit agreement to be governed by foreign law. Uh, however, the Chinese law on confidentiality matters is quite similar to Western law. Uh, so in practice, in, in our observation, many local Chinese companies probably will be very hasty to sign a confidentiality agreement which is governed by, for example, US law or UK law. Uh, uh, the, the major reason is they don't bother to hire a UK or a US lawyer to advise them on that contract. So they will say, I like this contract to be governed by Chinese law. So this is some uh, resistance that you probably will see. Uh, in terms of enforcement of confidentiality, uh, it is not easy. Uh, uh, you will have to reserve evidence to prove that on which day and, and uh, in what way that confidential, entity, uh, confidential information that has been provided to the other party. My, my, some, of the, my, some of the tips that I offer to, to my clients is number one, take photos. Uh, if you share that with someone or if you have a meeting with someone, take photos with the other party. That can be the good evidence to prove that you met with the other party and discuss certain business matters. Uh, always mark confidential in whatever document that you exchange with the other party, including all the email exchanges. Uh, there's a Chinese law concept that is only confidential information that the providing party has take reasonable protection measures will be deemed to be confidential. Uh, so in other words, if you gave something to the other, the other party without marking this as a confidential information, that will not be protected as confidential. Uh, so uh, be careful in providing the information and always give the mark, perhaps on the left of the top hand of all the documents that you will share with them. The next question is in relation to, um, let's say you're taking your, your Chinese partner to court. Um, there's been a breach of contract. In general, do the courts favor foreign investors if they are in their right place of, of saying there's been a breach of contract? Or is it that, mostly because uh, this person is, is saying that you know in the media, it's easily portrayed that the Chinese courts favor Chinese people, Chinese employees, Chinese companies, and nothing is really favored for foreign investors. What is your experience on that? There has been, a, as you mentioned, there has been a lot of a good debate and discussion on the media and also among professionals whether the Chinese uh, judicial system actually is in favor of local parties. My personal view is this. Um, I, I think with the economic development, particularly when China entered into, become a member of the World Trade Organization, the way China made its law and also enforced its law has seen a lot of changes. Uh, at this moment, uh, in our experience, most of the local courts in large cities, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, are taken very reasonable position in giving or reviewing cases involving uh, foreign parties. Um, I can now exclude the possibility that in some smaller cities, uh, because of the quality of the local judges and their experience in handling complex GV matters, uh, some of their decisions may not make sense. And also in some local jurisdiction, there's a local protectionism, particularly if your local GV parties is, well, is very well local connected, uh, they probably will be able to impose a certain influence to the local court. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, I think the reality in China in terms of um, decision uh, regarding a foreign party uh, is becoming better. Uh, I think this is also confirmed by the major 
survey by both American Chamber of Commerce uh, annual white paper and the EU, EU Chamber of Commerce position paper. Um, having said that, uh, given that there's still some chance that your local party may have stronger local resources than you are as a foreign party, uh, I want to restate again my recommendation uh, considering arbitration, not court action, uh, when you have a dispute with a Ch Chinese party. Because in arbitration, you have the right to decide who will hear your dispute, uh, who will be the arbitrator, and how the process uh, will move forward uh, so that you can, to some extent, eliminate local protectionism uh, in the dispute resolution. Thanks, Steve. Um, the final question for today, it's, it's in relation to once the joint venture is actually established. So, you know, your, your focus throughout your presentation has been the, the contracts, tips on formulating the contracts, and in the end, making sure they're bulletproof. Um, but as we know, most joint ventures in China, the foreign investor is usually relying on the Chinese investor to operate and maintain the entity because they're based in China locally. How can a foreign huh. investor that's part of a, of a joint venture in China, how can they make sure that the company remains compliant um, from a legal huh. perspective, that, you know, that, that everything remains um, as has been promised within the contract terms? Hmm. The, the way that I uh, understand your question is actually your question raised uh, an important matter that's about control. Uh, yeah. um, I, I think I think given that a China JV is based in China, and in many cases, the foreign parties who is uh, very far away from the high port in China may not have the capacity or enough personnel to oversee the operation from the Western shareholders' perspective. So control will be important, but control is not only just about the control in the boardroom. Uh, I would recommend that you should also con consider control mechanism about control in the operational level and the financial matters. Uh, I would generally recommend our clients not to agree for the JV to select any financial head from your local JV partners. Uh, in many cases, your JV party will say, we have a very capable JV partner in my company. Why don't we hire him and work for the GV? I would suggest that the finance person should be hired from the open market uh, so that he will be independent and out of influence from your local parties. And now that's the control on the financial matter. Uh, you may also consider that the financial person not only report to the general manager, uh, but also the report to the board in which you will have a seat. Another control is about the operation. Uh, if uh, your local party, local JV party, will have the right to nominate the manager, uh, I would suggest that you should ask the right to nominate at least a deputy general manager who will be responsible for sales and marketing so that you will have full access uh, to the performance of the GV. Uh, and also, to some extent, allow you to uh, make sure the GV uh, handle compliance matter properly. Uh, supervisor board is another good place for you to consider, uh, for you to exercise check and balance and uh, control uh, to make sure that while you are busy with your major business in your home country, uh, you still have capacity of someone who will watch on the GV on your behalf uh, here in China. Great, Steve. Thank, thanks a lot for, for that uh, last part uh, of the Q&A. Um, so, as is typical, we have run out of time, and uh, unfortunately, we haven't gone through all the questions that uh, have been listed, but I would like to recommend that if you do have questions for Steve or you have questions for us at Kohler Group, you know, don't hesitate to contact us, and, and we would be happy to answer you directly. There were also a few questions that um, I didn't really want to reveal on, on, uh, on the webinar. There are more uh, personalized company-based questions. So again, I think it would be best to, to, to go ahead and, and just speak directly to you um, based on that. So if you do want to contact us, don't hesitate to. Steve, thank you very much for participating in today's webinar session and for the time of 
presenting your webinar and your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Just some uh, last minute admin. If you enjoyed today's webinar and you're interested in learning more about our Expansion into China webinar series and tips in terms of remaining compliant, the last few webinars, the last six, will be based on compliance issues and maintaining compliance um, within your entities. So please, please do register for them on our website. Last but not least, if you are interested in uh, obtaining free resources in relation to uh, China and expanding in China, then um, we, we offer those through our e-campaigns on our LinkedIn page as well as on our YouTube channels. So again, we look forward to seeing you all very soon, and we hope you enjoyed today's webinar session. Thank you very much, and goodbye.